All right, so it's a pleasure for me to not, all, not only welcome all of you who attend this talk, but in particular to our guest speaker, Hugo Grafczyk, who yeah, is currently a scientist at uh, Algorand Foundation. After a long career uh, in science, where he achieved a lot of interesting things in, at IBM, in our courses, uh, we mention a lot uh, technologies like IPsec, uh, Internet Key Exchange, SSL and TLS, HMAC and so on, but rarely have the time to look at the people behind that. And Hugo, that's one of the key people behind all these uh, things that are the cornerstone of today's Internet security. And so it's not a miracle that he got a lot of achievements in the scientific community, um, kind of fellow of uh, International Association of Cryptologic Research, many IBM prizes and also having been IBM fellow. And maybe some additional remarks. Why do we have uh, Hugo today with his talk? So we at TU Munich got awarded for our concept for an Algorand Center of Excellence uh, with a research program and accompanying activities, support from Algorand Foundation and via this link, we have uh, also this uh, invited talk here. So without further ado, Hugo, I want to give you the floor. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be talking to you um, on, and, 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 and be able to present you with, uh, with, with, with this particular uh, talk, but also uh, uh, talking to you as, as one of our uh, Algorand Centers of Excellence. Uh, um, you know, we, we, we definitely believe that uh, you, you, be, you deserve the, the qualified of uh, excellence. Um, you are doing a great work. Um, yeah, we, keep, we, we will keep collaborating and uh, hopefully we'll get some, some good things out of, uh, out of this program. So let me, let me uh, share my screen. Um, Okay. Uh, see that. Uh, okay. Can, can you see the the PowerPoint full yes. screen? Okay, good. Good. <laughs> okay, so um, I I have two parts uh, to this uh, presentation. The first uh, half of the presentation will be a, a, a short, uh, high-level conceptual introduction to the Algorand uh, consensus protocol to, to, to give you an idea of uh, where the, the good properties of this protocol come from. Uh, and the second part, um, I'll talk a little bit about a, a work or a series of work that we are doing, the research group in the foundation, about how to run private computing on public uh, blockchains. And this, the two parts will be related because in the second part we use mechanisms that were introduced by the Algorand protocol. Okay, so first part, why Algorand, the conceptual introduction. Um, I, I guess that most of you know what the blockchain is, but just let me go fast uh, just to, to the very high level uh, introduction. Uh, so a blockchain is basically a public ledger of, uh, of transactional data. It's represented as a, a chain of blocks and the information, the data is distributed over a system of, uh, of, of, of distributed uh, nodes, of multiple nodes. Um, <clears throat> since we all want to have the same view of what blocks are in the chain, we need a protocol to do that and these protocols are called consensus protocols, and I will be discussing Algorand's one. Uh, we, the intention is to have a publicly verifiable uh, log of, of, of these blocks. Uh, we want this chain to be tamper-proof in the sense that whatever is written there cannot be changed in the future. 
And we are talking about public blockchains that are permissionless, meaning that anyone can participate. You don't need a central authority to tell you that you are allowed or not allowed to participate. Uh, there are many, many flavors and ways to do consensus, and really uh, different blockchains have different protocols, but you know, one, one more or less common element to them is there is a party that uh, is, is chosen as a block proposer. That block proposer chooses a block, uh, propagates it uh, through the network uh, of, of the nodes, uh, and the uh, nodes need somehow to check the correctness of transactions in the block and also the right of the block proposer to actually be a block proposer and uh, through this mechanism achieve consensus on what is the next block to be added to the chain. Uh, so the first uh, the first uh, permissionless uh, blockchain is uh, Bitcoin uh, and that uses a consensus mechanism known as Nakamoto consensus. So for the case of how to, of, of choosing the block proposer, uh, what Bitcoin does is uh, you know th there is a puzzle uh, through a challenge value B that is published actually for each for each block. And the first party to win to, to solve that uh, puzzle wins the right to propose a block. Specifically, the way this puzzle is uh, de designed, defined in, the, in Bitcoin, is that the, there is this challenge value B that is uh, uh, published. Now, to solve the puzzle means to find another value T, so that if you concat concatenate B and T and you hash that concatenated value, if you the output is a value that you can think of it you know, in terms of, of numbers, if it starts with D zeros, then you solve the, the, the puzzle. And, and this D is a difficulty parameter that can be changed depending on different, uh, different uh, state situations in, 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 in the protocol. Uh, now the point is that uh, the only the only known way to solve such a, a, a puzzle uh, is trying just exhaustive exhaustively hashing all kind of t values t until you find one that has this property of the d zeros and that takes about two to the d hashes, which in terms uh, in practical terms in the Bitcoin um, protocol takes you know trillions of hashes. Uh, now, so it is very hard to, to solve this puzzle. On the other hand, it's very easy. If I solve the password, the puzzle, I have T, I can show you T, everyone can concatenate B and T, hash it with a single hash, compare, the, uh, um, see that it starts with the zeros and that's it. So <clears throat> solving the puzzle is very hard. Uh, verifying it is very easy. Uh, and this, uh, you know, uh, relatively simple idea, you know, simple after you have it, uh, has actually allowed this really revolution, revolutionary invention that allows for this decentralized permissionless payment system, uh, which is Bitcoin. Now, I'm saying that it's beautiful because, you know, it's, uh, it's the simplicity, the elegance, the, the power. But why almost perfect? Uh, so it is because it is very, very resource wasteful. Computing trillions of hashes is very, very hard, very computing uh, intensive and very energy intensive. Uh, and it's a waste in the sense that, you know, every miner computes the things in the network, but there is only one that is going to enjoy the, the solution of the, of the puzzle. Uh, and it is so so energy uh, um, or electricity intensive that it can power uh, the, the whole uh, energy consumption of a medium sized country like uh, like uh, Sweden. So can we do better? Better. Uh, what we would like to do is to comp to replace the heavy computation of um, of uh, one second, but okay. <laughs> the heavy computation that every node in the network uh, is is doing by actually a, a light local computation. If you do that, not only you will reduce waste, but we also add to the decentralization and scalability. 
because of a better performance and also allowing more people to uh, to participate. Right now, the only way to uh, participate is to join a mining pool uh, that requires uh, millions of dollars uh, to to act, to activate. So that's the idea. We try to find some uh, a powerful puzzle, but still easy to solve. Or yeah. uh, and actually, this is done in Algorand through this invention of uh, Silvio Micali. Uh, what is called verifiable random functions that replace the trillions of hashing. Um, so in Algorand, like in Bitcoin, there is also this idea of having the puzzle. Uh, to for, to select the block proposer. The difference is that instead of trillions uh, hashes and 10 minutes, which is what takes to solve that puzzle in Bitcoin, here we have a puzzle that takes just a fraction of a millisecond to compute. And uh, so the, there will be a single or actually a small number of winners. And everyone can can verify that whoever the winner is that actually has solved the pass the puzzle the this brings to an electricity consumption in Agron, which is about 100 million 100 million times less than bitcoin or 10 million times less than uh, ethereum with proof of work so what are these verifiable random functions uh, so these are cryptographic functions Every participant in the blockchain, we have a private key and also a public key. The private key is only known to the participant. The public key is known to every other participant. It's public information that is recorded in the blockchain. Uh, the VRF has uh, two properties, randomness and verifiability. Randomness means that if, you, if I am giving a value B and I know my private key for the VRF, I can compute the value of the PRF on the private key and on the value B. Uh, and the property of this function is that we'll output random values. You know, uh, cryptographically uh, is a function that is computationally indistinguishable from a random function, but we can think of it as a random function. It is unpredictable by anyone. If I don't know the private key of some participant, there is no way I can compute the output. And even if I have my own private key, I cannot bias the VRF output. Whatever is the, the output, there is a single output, and I cannot cheat about that. Indeed, if I show a pair, a BR, where I claim that R is the output of the VRF on this value B, anyone can verify that this is actually the case by using my public key. And both operations, the, the, I mean, the, the, the computation of the function and the verify, verifying each of them takes a fraction of a millisecond to compute. Um, okay, so now that we have this notion of VRF, the way a block proposer is chosen is as following, a value B is, is, is published, as well as the threshold value T. T uh, B changes with each block, T depends on the number of participants or to the total stake uh, of participants. Uh, and each participant takes it, its private key, it computes it on the value B, on this public value that was uh, computed, and if the output of the value as a number is less than T, then it wins the right to choose a block. Uh, and the effect is similar to the Nakamoto hash base lottery, uh, in the sense that uh, there is only one or a small number of, of, of uh, block proposals that are chosen this way, but with much, much, much less waste of energy. As I said, trillion of hashes are now replaced with a, 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 the fraction of millisecond that it takes to compute the VRF. Everyone can participate because now the computational burden is much, much lower. And this, uh, this provides basis to the three main properties of a blockchain, decentralization, scalability, and security. Um, and the, um, now, if it's so easy to participate, then, you know, everyone in the world can participate and we will have a malicious party that will flood the, the, the network with, with uh, meaningless uh, blocks and stuff like that. 
So we need a way of actually, you know, uh, avoiding this kind of attack, you know, called civil attacks. And the way this is done is by what's called proof of stake, which is now, it's true that parties, every, any party can um, participate, but the ability to uh, choose blocks uh, and participate in other forms of, uh, other parts of the consensus protocol is to have uh, enough uh, stake, where stake is the number of algos that the participant uh, owns. And the, now the, the probability to be chosen as a block proposer is a proportional to the stake. And the way this is done in Algorand is by that threshold T that I mentioned before, that the, your VRF needs to be less, the, the VRF output needs to be less than T. That T is the parameter that actually uh, controls how much stake or, or, or how uh, your stake helps you in winning that, uh, that lottery or, or you know, solving that puzzle. Um, <clears throat> now, having more stake helps, having more computational power doesn't help. You need the stake. And the principle of any proof of stake pro uh, protocol is that, you know, the more skin on the game you have, uh, the more you would like to care about the system integrity. That doesn't mean that everyone will do that. And these protocols don't assume that everyone is honest and participate exactly as the protocol says, uh, but uh, rather that enough of the, of the participants are, are, uh, are honest. Um, okay. So uh, what happens when a block proposer when a block proposer is chosen by by this VRF? It it, it, it its function is now to choose a block, which is a set of uh, transactions that everyone will have to to check that are actually valid transactions, uh, and will propagate that block together with the proof of having won the puzzle, main, meaning a proof uh, that its computer, its VRF value on B, this value B is less than T. Everyone can check that because as I said, this is a very easy to uh, verify uh, properly. Um, now the issue is that uh, uh, the block, pro the, the, but first of all, there may be more than one block proposer, ju just a few, a handful of them, but you still need to decide which one you're going to add. And also there is a possibility that uh, maybe a, 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 a corrupt party also uh, sends a, a, a bad block. So uh, what we need to have a, a way of deciding which one of the blocks that were being proposed actually is chosen as the next block. And for that, we choose a, run, a, a committee, a, a small committee. I mean, small committee is actually a, in terms of amount of, of stake. Uh, and we choose that committee to verify um, the blocks and vote to accept or reject it. Actually, you see, we, we need more than one committee for that, but it is important that these committees are small because, you know, we could have asked everyone in the network to do these computations, but that would take, would be very inefficient. So for scalability and performance, you really want these committees to be small. And the, this, uh, it's fundamental that these committees are chosen at random in, in order to, uh, to be able to achieve the properties that we want from the consensus. And the way these committees are, are chosen is by the same VRF mechanism, meaning, uh, the, again, the, the same thing as we had before in order to choose a, a, a block proposal. Now we can use that exactly for uh, for these committees so the the way it's done is that every every uh, participant in the network computes the vrf and if that vrf has some some uh, some value or or, or false in, in in some interval then it's chosen for that committee and we will see wh wh why this committee is, is important to to chosen at random um so ju just uh, a word about um, uh, 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 
I, com I mean, there are many comparisons to Bitcoin. For example, the the next block in the, in algorithm takes four seconds to to be decided, uh, while it takes sixty minutes to 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 finality on in 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 Bitcoin. Meaning, it takes you if you buy a, a coffee using Bitcoin and the cashier waits for a confirmation. Uh, of, uh, of of the transaction of that payment, it will take sixty minutes. Your coffee will be cold. Uh, in ca in the case of Algorand, it will take only four seconds. And when Algorand adds a block a block to the chain, it's a final block. In uh, in in Bitcoin, you have these uh, possible uh, forks uh, that need to be resolved, and this is one of the reasons that you need these sixty minutes. And also, there will be transactions that at some point a node can see as being approved while later being uh, basically reversed. So this is a very important uh, uh, dif dif differentiation, which comes as part of the properties of the consensus protocol. Uh, so actually, I thought that uh, I was going to say this later, but let me go back to this slide, because what is very wh why is it important that the uh, Committee is chosen at random because because the uh, we want the attacker that wants to corrupt the uh, you know part, wants wants to get an advantage on choosing the next block. Uh, we want uh, one one strategy for the attacker is to see okay who are in the committee. Okay, I go and and corrupt the the people in the committee and I can now maliciously choose uh, the next uh, block. Uh, however, that is not possible in, in Algorand because these committees are chosen at random. And the only way to know that a participant was chosen in a committee is when it actually produces output. But at that point, it's too late for the attacker to go and, uh, and corrupt them because the output was generated and the necessary secrets uh, are, 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 uh, are, are uh, deleted. So it's too late for the attacker to actually try to do something about it. Uh, committees are randomly chosen uh, by the VRF. Uh, only the member of the committee knows that it was selected, but it knows it, it, because it knows that its VRF is false in the interval uh, or, or it's less than an threshold that was uh, set in the network. <clears throat> That uh, uh, that committee member does some action of, from which it has to uh, send a message to the, the network, and after that action, basically the the member of the committee is done with the work from the committee. If the attacker wants to attack it, it's too late. It has done its work. The attacker cannot change that because it has been propagated in the in the network. Um, so um, this is the importance of randomly chosen committees. The other thing that is important in this, uh, in, in this way of choosing committees is that these committees can be small. Now, not only they can be small, uh, it, it, they are in the size of the committees is independent of the number of, uh, of participants in the network. So if, if you have 10,000 nodes in the total blockchain, uh, then the, part, the, the the committees are of certain size. If you have ten million uh, participants in in the in the uh, in the blockchain, still the the size of the committee is the same. And if you have a billion participants, the size of the committee is the same. I mean, the size of the committee has to do with some probabilistic uh, uh, probability uh, formula and is independent of the total number of participants. That, that is very important because it means that uh, the, the blockchain can grow as much as you want and still have the, the same complexity of the consensus protocol, which is uh, essential for scalability. Okay, so this is to give you, ah, and uh, I have this uh, thing, I, I mean, all, all these mechanisms actually uh, are the ones that um, um, see. these are the mechanisms that actually allow you to be um, to 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 get many of the great uh, properties of algorithm you know scalable to billions of uh, users 
because it requires very moderate hardware requirements. You know, you, you can participate with with with, with the you know, regular laptop. Uh, you don't need to to have a minimal minimal stake, something that is needed in in some uh, other protocols. So everyone can participate in that sense. Uh, it's efficient because of these elements that there was uh, both the deficiency of the VRF, the deficiency of, of the consensus. Uh, uh, you can achieve a, a, a high number of uh, transactions, and currently 6,000 transactions per second. There are ways that uh, this number can be increased, uh, uh, certainly for uh, 10,000 transactions. Maybe beyond that, we will need to do some other stuff like sharding, but. Uh, uh, this is already very, very efficient. And as I said, it takes uh, just four seconds uh, to compute a block and you have, you, 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 you never have forks as in the case of Bitcoin. So it's instant transaction finality. The fees are very low also uh, thanks to the low computational burden of, of, of computing the things. Um, it takes low energy and a small car carbon footprint as, as opposed to, to uh, certainly any proof of work um, a blockchain. It's secure, secure against corruption and actually denial of service. I didn't touch on, on that, but uh, there is also security against network partitioning in the sense that if the attacker controls the network, which is, is an assumption in the analysis of these protocols, then it can actually uh, create a partition. It, it can uh, make some uh, messages uh, reach their um, their targets or not reach their targets. But and which means that there may be some time in which different um, the nodes in the network see different uh, uh, messages on different blocks being transmitted. But once the uh, net the partitioning is 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 resolved. Uh, going back to the assumption that the all honest uh, uh, participants or most honest participants get messages uh, transmitted by other honest participants. Once you get that, then you go back to the same security, meaning that even in that case, there is no way for the attacker to convince two uh, honest parties to accept two different blocks. Okay, so that's uh, as an introduction to 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 Algorand consensus. Of course, there is uh, in all these protocols. There are many more details, but uh, basically, this is the these are the basics of the of of, of this protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if there are questions at this point, I can yes. try to answer. Perfect. Uh, so there are a couple of questions actually in the tweetback. Do you, should we read, read them out for you, Hugo, or do you have the tweetback opened next uh, to you? Let me try to get there. Also for the audience, here is the link to the tweetback. We didn't mention it in, in detail at the beginning, so it's the same that is being used for the network security lecture. So please feel free to ask the questions there. Uh, Hugo will try to answer some of them now, and also there'll be additional Q&A session after the, the end of his talk. So, okay, so there is a question about the 51%. Uh, so in, 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 the, um, in a protocol like, uh, like uh, Algorand that is based on, uh, you know, basically on the Byzantine agreement uh, 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 resolution or consensus, you need the two thirds of the parties to be, uh, to, to be honest. Uh, to set the, the 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 parameters of the size of uh, of of blocks of uh, committees, uh, there is the the, the assumption is, is more of a seventy five percent of uh, of honest honest parties. Uh, I mean that that is not fundamental, but our numbers that are chosen for to set parameters, uh, and the the. So the the the, re, the reason that there I mean the fact that there are no attacks in that case is actually part of the uh, Byzantine agreement the, the, the properties of the Byzantine agreement, which is the this this protocol that uses the, this random uh, random randomly chosen uh, committees, um, and that and, and by doing that you don't have a requirement of minimal. Uh, Minimal stake. 
Um, okay, is MEV a problem? Um, okay, the, MEV is 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 a problem in in all uh, protocols depending on the ability of the attacker to how much control it has on the on on the network. Um, but it's 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 less than uh, in in other uh, cases, especially because of the but the short uh, finality period. There is uh, much less time to to play these games. But the, the, uh, but there is in principle the ability to do some uh, MEV uh, attacks. Um, now. Is Algorand suitable for data intensive application? What would be the estimated cost to store at around 100 kilobytes uh, per, per second? I, 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 can I cannot give uh, uh, specific numbers here. Um, but uh, again, uh, the, what, what a participant nodes needs to, um, to, to keep the last uh, 1000 blocks that that's what uh, a regular participant is uh, keeping the the there is the the the, the, the nodes that will uh, um, store the whole uh, blockchain and this this definitely require a uh, high high storage uh, um, ability uh, there, there are ways that uh, uh, the things can be alleviated, for example, by having uh, checkpoints. And we now have uh, something called uh, state proofs that will uh, help, uh, you know, having checkpoints that you can start uh, checking things from the last uh, checkpoint instead of going and having to check the whole history. Still, there will be uh, notes that will keep the whole history for, for uh, uh, specific cases. But that will not be the the, the regular operation. Um, okay. Uh, will the idea of uh, can uh, okay? Uh, I'll, I, there is a question about can the blockchain keep a secret that I will uh, talk <laughs> about uh, next. We, ha we have a couple of questions regarding the committee sizes. How large are the committees and how they are being selected yeah. from the yeah, so tens of thousands of nodes? Yeah. So, so there are, a com so first of all, the committee sizes is in terms of, uh, of the number of algos, not on the number of uh, members. Uh, a, a, a member that has a high stake can have more than one uh, seat. In these committees, the committees go between uh, something like uh, 1,000 uh, seats or 1,000 algos to maybe 5,000. Uh, again, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but that that is the the order of magnitude of uh, committees. Um, so you know, if if you here really the 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 choice the the, the choice is stake related. So it's really about number of, of algos. So, so between 1,000 to 5,000 uh, uh, seats, each seat per, 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 uh, per algo. So if you have half of the full stake of the, 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 uh, in, in the network, you will have half of the seats in the committee you know, in, in, on, on, on average. Um, and I was wondering what the difference between the VRF and the typical signature is. You can think about the VRF as being a, a signature, a, ha a signature on top of which a hash is compute uh, hash, which you know cryptographically is what we call random oracles. So you hash the output of the signature. So as long as the signature itself is has unique values, you know, uh, then uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, the hash of a signature that has unique value outputs uh, can be used as a VRF. So uh, that's the hash gives you the randomness. The the signature gives you the verifiability. Uh, okay, uh, let me go to the next part of the of the presentation. Uh, all right. So 
uh, yeah, so this is the second part. Uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, a, a work that is very much based on ideas of Algorand, uh, but applicable to in, in, to, to to other uh, blockchains as well. Uh, uh, in the case of Algorand, really the existing mechanisms are much more uh, friendly to to this type of protocol. Um, so uh, basically, this is about doing private computing on on, on public uh, blockchains. This work with uh, several co-authors. At the end, I have a, a slide with uh, with that lists some works related uh, to to this topic, and uh, that also lists my my colleagues, my my co-authors. All right, so. Um, Okay, so uh, that's the title. Now, um, we can th think uh, as blockchain as being computing platforms. Uh, you know, so far, I, I mentioned transactions uh, as, as uh, you know, blocks being uh, containing uh, transaction information, but these transactions uh, or uh, can also be extended to do actual computations through uh, smart contracts. So we can really look at blockchains as being a computing platforms. Now, as a computing platform, not only just a computing platform, but it's a trusted computing uh, platform, uh, trusted in the sense that as long as an attacker cannot break the consensus underlying the blockchain, then it can also not uh, bias or change or uh, uh, lead to incorrect computation. Uh, now, this, uh, this elephant uh, that you see there, it's, it's part of another, I mean, <laughs> another version of this uh, uh, presentation. So it, it, it represents the blockchain, okay? And we think about the blockchain in this case as one trusted party, uh, participants can input uh, the values to this uh, trusted party and that party will compute uh, the function that we asked it uh, to do. So, you know, these uh, inputs x1, x2, x3, there is a function f and this trusted party will output uh, f on these inputs, okay? So we that's one way of thinking of uh, blockchains uh, augmented with smart contracts. And uh, the question is, can uh, uh, today's public blockchains be actually really thought as trusted parties? And the answer is yes, as long as your computation is on public data, because that's what smart contracts would do. And again, uh, it's as secure as the underlying consensus. If you trust the consensus, then you can trust the output. And in that sense, you can, you can think of it as a trusted party. However, if the computation is done on the, on secret data, I mean, there are secret inputs to this function f, then that cannot be done uh, by, by these uh, public blockchains without adding something to them. So now we are going to talk about what can be added or done to actually be able to compute on, on secret data. Now, why, why do we want to compute on secret data? Well, there are many, 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 many applications for that. Uh, I'll, I'll mention some of them. Um, state proofs is uh, a way of computing uh, checkpoints in the protocol uh, that um, um, allow you to uh, to be I mean, to to verify at some point uh, that uh, you know. A way of, of way when the state proof is computed it allows you to actually be sure about all the blocks that were and about the blocks that came before before that checkpoint and you know next time if you want to check uh, uh, blocks that came after the checkpoint you only need to start from that checkpoint uh, point um, this is important for for efficiency and it's very important as an oracle uh, of providing a view or easy way of verify one blockchain to to another one. Okay, that's what it's you know it's 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 fundamental for uh, interoperability. Can be used uh, as an oracle. Can be used in in, in bridges. Now, uh, Algorand does have state proofs these uh, days already. 
But if you had something like uh, this kind of uh, private computation, you could actually have a state proof that will be just a single signature and all uh, you need to verify that the uh, state proof or checkpoint is just verifying a regular signature. The only, need, only, need, only thing that you need to trust is that you have the correct public key for the whole uh, blockchain. So that, that's one example, an important example of something you could do. You could do things like elections and auctions, you know, where uh, participants enter secret data, encrypted uh, votes, uh, or encrypted uh, um, inputs uh, to, to, to the action. And uh, I mean, this input will be encrypted by uh, uh, participant keys, and therefore, uh, in, in order to eventually have uh, the election uh, defined, you will need to, to, to have some decryption keys uh, that uh, will, you know, will give you the output of, 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 of these computations. Uh, and in more generally, you, what you can do is private smart contracts, smart contracts that depend on secret keys. Uh, for example, I can have a smart contract that <coughs> says in some settings, uh, decrypt my, some subset of my medical records and send it to someone. Uh, so that will require decrypting some of my medical records and re-encrypting for someone else. And you want all of that to happen without any of this information uh, being visible in the network or to, to anyone other than the, the, uh, the allowed parties. And for that, you need that the, somehow the blockchain will need to, to be able to do some decryption or re-encryption uh, functionality that, of course, you cannot do with uh, regular blockchain, uh, which would uh, actually expose the data because of the transparency. And there are many other uh, things that you can do, like social recovery of keys, uh, wills, and the set of testaments. Um, and very, one very significant thing is that in these cases, smart contracts actually act as a, a, as a policy enforcers, which is one of the complicated elements in any uh, privacy base or privacy oriented applications, which not only requires managing keys and, and keeping their secrecy and their integrity, but also uh, ensuring that the policy is correct and enforced correctly. So in this case, smart contracts can do that. Okay, so how do uh, we do the thing? Um, so first of all, we have an adversarial mo mo model. Uh, we think this as, as a blockchain with a network of nodes, most of which are honest. I mean, there's a, a majority of honest, uh, or, or, or a big majority, you know, uh, over two thirds of uh, of honest uh, parties. Uh, dishonest means uh, different ways of being dishonest. You can be dishonest by not participating when you, you should. Uh, you be can be uh, not honest in the sense that the attacker knows your secrets or the full malicious uh, level of corruption, which is that you are completely controlled by the attacker. Now, again, we, we uh, in our model, we consider uh, malicious uh, parties uh, and the malicious parties are not static. They can uh, change from, uh, from, you know, time to time, some parties can be dishonest and they can, uh, you know, the, the attacker may lose uh, control of that party, but it can control other ones or go back to a previously uh, corrupted party, etc. So, you know, we have these uh, general purpose uh, dynamic uh, abilities of the attacker. And in this model, we want to have secure, scalable computation that can include private inputs. Uh, and scalable means that the computation should not increase in complexity uh, as more nodes join the system. And for this, we follow really the algorithms approach in which we are going to use uh, committees of uh, random committees of size that is independent of the total number of, uh, of net nodes in the network. Uh, so as before, as in case of uh, uh, algorithm, we will get random committees 
for every step in the protocol uh, chosen at random in a way that they represent the entire system in some probabilistic sense. Uh, we will choose them in a way that with high probability the committees will have honest majority. And as I said, the size of them will be independent of the number of nodes, which is uh, again fundamental for scalability. No, well, the, I mean, there are many technical challenges in this world, but one technical challenge, basic technical challenge is that if the attacker says, if, uh, controls 20% of the, of the network of the parties or the stake, and, you know, we need small committees, let's say a committee that is just of size, 2% uh, of the total uh, size, you know, we don't choose committees as 2% of the total because that would mean being dependent on the total number of, uh, of of participants, but you know, let's say we we choose a committee of three thousand uh, algos, and uh, and let's say that that is two percent of the total. Well, it will be smaller, but anyway, let's say two percent of the total. Then the attacker has enough uh, budget of corruption to actually corrupt parties that include that small committee, right? So. Um, the committee is too small to say that the attacker cannot corrupt it. Okay, uh, so th then you have a problem because that the attacker will corrupt the committee. But again, using the idea uh, that I showed before from Algorand, that is only possible. The attacker can corrupt this committee only if it knows who the committee members are. Okay, if we hide who the committee members are until these committee members have done their action and erase their secrets, their private inputs, then the attacker can corrupt the, the committee members, but it will be too late. The information that it will find and the information that it will be able to propagate from that member, uh, it's, it's too late to do that. Um, so we want now to have committees that uh, will not reveal to the attacker who they are until uh, the, the the work is uh, is, is is performed. Um, part of the committee members will uh, be adversarial, uh, but uh, we will ensure by the randomness of the selection that only a minority of these nodes can be adversarial. And the, the only way of, of communicating between the, the participants in this protocol is by a public a broadcast channel. And this brings us to this notion of uh, YOSO protocols. Uh, that's the name we give it, which YOSO stands for You Only Speak Once. Um, Okay, so uh, for, from the point of view of the attacker, all nodes uh, look the same. Uh, and the only way for the attacker to actually know that a, a, a node is doing something is when the node sends a message to the network. Before that, uh, all, all, all nodes look the same. Now, what, what can a node do? A node can monitor uh, communications uh, in that uh, assume broadcast channel and do local work. Uh, a, 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 any, any participant can learn whether it has been chosen for a committee. Um, and you know, there are different ways in which this choice will happen in these protocols. Uh, but again, adversary will not learn about participation in a committee until the node sends messages. So, if it's so, here is where the you only speak once in the sense that for that particular task that you are uh, doing for that particular computation, you you compute internally, create an an out a, a message and uh, and and output that into the network. Um, so you, the, every uh, committee member will uh, broadcast a single message as a member of that committee. Of course, a node, you know, a, an actual node, an actual machine can be chosen to be a, a participant in more than one committee, 
Uh, so it will be speak more than once, but for the task in one committee, it will only broadcast one message. And uh, up before sending that message, it will erase any secrets that could help the attacker, uh, you know, um, uh, influence the computation or, 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 or learn secrets. Again, once you send a message, it is too late for the attacker to corrupt you if the, if the reason for corruption is to learn something about that task that you just completed. Okay. Um, so, you know, this, you only speak once. The uh, model is a model that we define in, in a formal way, but actually uh, it's, it's not a new model because as, you, as we've seen, actually uh, both Nakamoto consensus and Algorand are use of protocols. For example, in the case of uh, Bitcoin, uh, no one knows who is going to win the, 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 who is going to solve the puzzle, right? To find the, that, that value T that wins the puzzle. Uh, so wh whoever wins that immediately pro propagates the block together with the proof that it solved the puzzle. Uh, and at that point, again, it's too late for the attacker. The 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 block the block has been uh, has been uh, propagated. So the block proposal is unpredictable, and once the block is broadcast, too late for the attacker to choose its own block. And uh, you know, more generally, these lottery mechanisms, uh, of which Algorand is uh, is an example, using a VRF. Uh, is also a, a, an example of a YOSA protocol. However, the interesting part of this, uh, of, of this work, which is the motivation I, I presented before, is actually doing the things but with private inputs, it's something that uh, neither Bitcoin or Algorand uh, uh, can, can solve by, by, by themselves. Um, okay, so uh, in particular, Nodes cannot self-select uh, to fill secret input roles. So, uh, in 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 Algorand, we saw that actually a a, a committee member uh, it it's, it self-selects. It it computes the VRF and sees whether the VRF is under some value. Okay, uh, you could actually do that also with a, a secret input. But then the question is, how does a node get a secret input if no one knows who that node is? Okay, uh, you know, I'm computing, I need to get a, a piece of some secret or some, uh, some cryptographic key. That's part of my secret inputs. I need to get the secret inputs from someone, uh, but who knows to send these inputs to me if, if I'm the only one that knows that I'm in the committee. Um, so, we will have to uh, solve that that question. So before I show uh, how to do that or give you an idea of how this is done, let's see how a uh, YOSO protocol would be specified. You know, in, uh, in regular multi-party protocols, we define the participants as uh, you know entities with some identifiers or identification. You know, we call party one sends a value V to party two. Uh, in the specifications, in this case, party one and party two represent actual physical machines. Uh, in, in the YOSA protocol, we specify these through roles. You know, a role is a function that you have inside the protocol, but we don't know who this role is going, uh, who is going to perform that role. So the role is player three in round seven, shareholder two of secret five, et cetera, a, a functional role rather than a machine uh, performing that role. Um, and at execution time, these roles need to be assigned to actual machines. So we, we design the protocol only on the basis of roles, but then we need to have a way of attaching actual roles to actual machines. And that, that happens at execution time. Uh, now that assignment saying role number 13 goes to uh, a, a particular machine 
that needs to be done in a way that is unpredictable for the attacker again because we want this property that the attacker does not know who to attack to learn the secrets um, and you know in principle there are different ways of doing that the way we do it in our solution is by choosing again uh, choosing the machines to which we are going to uh, to uh, um, assign roles in some random way um, in a way that the the selected machine learns which role it was assigned to okay without that machine having to to speak to to send any messages for that it can receive messages that are being propagated in the network and it's the only one the, that machine is the only one that can see when a, 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 a message is directed to to that machine of course everyone can see these messages that are propagated in the network but only the machine that is assigned is able to realize that this message is coming for 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 that machine and that message can uh, can carry some secrets um how how are messages encrypted to that particular machine i'll i'll show in a moment so the yoso specification has two components you have the the role interaction protocol is the one that specifies the actions of the different roles you know as again um, role seven in round five read values broadcast by role three in round two and sends their sum to role two in round eight I mean that, that could be the specification of of a role you know depending on on on, on inputs and depending on other roles uh, of uh, outputs um, so that's the the role interaction protocol uh, what be what would replace a regular multi-party protocol but in this case be role based and then there is the second part which is uh, run at execution time uh, assigning roles to actual machines so so if you want to do a yosa protocol you need to uh, uh, um, define these two parts of the protocol one nice thing about this stuff is that the, these modules can be independent uh, in the sense that uh, you know you can combine a role interaction pro protocol uh, with different uh, assignment protocols and you can choose this depending on 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 on, on your application and, and on your resources um, okay so one thing that i've uh, been, i said before is that um, you know a machine is is somehow chosen at random in in, in, in some way and that machine gets assigned a role and that role has private inputs and you know magically the machine learns uh, that it was uh, selected and magically that machine learns also the private inputs that it requires for that um, for executing that role so here is where you know the the the, the real cryptography comes into play uh, and I will not get into the actual mechanisms uh, because, first of all, it would take me, you know, I, I would need another half hour uh, to to present the things. But also because, I, uh, you know, I, I I'm not I, I'm not assuming that uh, all of you have the the cryptographic background for that. And maybe more importantly, because really, uh, you know, I, I I want you to understand conceptually how this works. If you are interested in the details, uh, there are the papers to to go and check. So, uh, so the, to give you an idea, for those that know uh, uh, what identity-based encryption is, then it's it's easy to see that one can do this kind of thing. So, identity-based encryption, you know, regular public key encryption is an encryption that everyone can encrypt under some public key, and only the owner of the corresponding private key can decrypt. Identity-based encryption is the same, except that the public, instead of random public keys, the, the identity of the party acts as public key. So if I have an identity, everyone can write a message to that identity, and only that identity will have the private keys that they are required to decrypt. So 
now you can think at, that at this identity-based encryption with the identity is actually wrong. So when machine uh, M1 uh, wants to send a message M to M2, then what M1 will do will encrypt the message M under the uh, roll two key. Okay, okay. So okay, we have uh, two machines here. M1 was a sign roll R1. Machine M2 was a sign roll R2. Now machine one running roll one says this output send it to roll R2. Okay, so machine one when it produces output from roll one will make will output the thing will broadcast this output but with an encryption that only roll two can decrypt when machine m2 is assigned to roll r2 then that assignment means for machine m2 to get private keys for uh, decrypting information written to roll two Fortunately, all of the things can actually be done with uh, with, with some existing uh, uh, cryptographic um, tools and some new tools that we needed uh, we need to introduce to to do the thing. Actually, we can do this with this role-based encryption, but we can also do this with standard public key encryption. Again, I will not get into the details of how the things uh, are done. Um, now, when the machines uh, uh, M1 sends data, then it exposes itself. Uh, now we know that, oh, that machine was assigned at least some role. Uh, so it can be a target for the attacker to go and break and co corrupt that the machine and learn the secrets. But again, the, we specify that the machine, before actually sending its output uh, message, it erases all the relevant secret data. So again, too late for the uh, attacker to corrupt that machine and get something out of it. Well, one thing I didn't touch upon is how do you uh, choose, uh, how do you assign machines to roles? So one way of doing that, this is not the only way, but uh, maybe the conceptually simpler way of doing that, is that you will have a nominating committee. The nominating committee will be of the type of Algorand, which is a self-nominating uh, self committee. <clears throat> the participants in the committee are all those par parties that whose VRF on some value is less than some threshold, okay? So that nominating committee, every member in that committee will have uh, the um, the task of choosing a machine to a given role. So that committee member will say, okay, this role will be assigned to this particular machine, which may, basically means that a machine will get the private keys that are needed to uh, decrypt information that was encrypted to role R, okay? And the selection of M for that role by that committee member is done, uh, you know, it's chosen, that machine is chosen at random among all machines. These choices will also be uh, weighted by, by state. Uh, because at the end of the day, we, you, we always want to have uh, enough uh, or, or small enough number of corrupted uh, participants in, mm -hmm. this, uh, in these committees. Okay, so M gets the private keys for roll uh, R, and we do it in a way that only the machine M learns that it was selected for that role, and only M learns the private key needed to decrypt stuff encrypted for roll R. However, you know, you can say, well, if uh, now a nominating party uh, chose the machine M, then that nominating party knows who M is. So if that nominating party is, is, is corrupted, then the attacker learns who that machine M is and can go and corrupt it. And that's, that's true, uh, but we have to do this in a way that the, at the end of all these mechanisms, the number of corrupted parties in, in a new committee, uh, um, on, or, on, on a committee of roles 
will have a, a low enough number of corruption, which in this case will need a minority of, uh, of corrupted parties. Um, so if really the, cho the nominator is corrupted, when, then we will consider the machine that was chosen also as corrupted. Uh, and we will count that towards our uh, you know, number of corruptions. And we have to run the thing in a way that the number of corruption never goes above the threshold that we need for security. So all this stuff is quite uh, subtle. And you know, I'm definitely oversimplifying things. But that gives you an idea of, of how these things can, can work. Um, now, we, we have a lot of knowledge accumulated in cryptography about multi-party computation. And you know, one, one would like to take multi-party computation protocols and transform it in them into YOSO protocols. But this is quite challenging because uh, most multi-party computation protocols uh, parties do speak more than once. And taking a, a, a party that speaks more than once and, and decomposing it into multiple roles that only speak once is, 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 is very, very challenging. In particular, you know, one, one idea would be, okay, you know, I have a party P, P1 in the multi-party protocol that has, speaks in three different rounds. Okay, so I will, um, I would replicate P1 into P1 prime, P1 uh, double prime, et cetera, and each one will carry the next computation. Actually, it, it, that doesn't work like that. I mean, it doesn't work in, in a sense that you can prove that something like that cannot work. Um, actually, you can't, uh, in, in a, in a YOSO protocol, if you want to pass a secret to some other party, you can't really do that, pass one secret to one uh, party because then the number of accumulated corruptions is too high. You know, it's, it's a little bit of a cheating of what I said before. So really when you want to move one uh, secret from one machine to another role, what actually happens in this protocol is that that value that you want to communicate is secret shared and the recipient of that role is not just one party, it's, it's a committee that for which the inputs are secret shared. So, you know, if you, if you, if you know this stuff, you can get an idea. Uh, if, if not, you know, the, the whole point here is to say that when I said that a, a nominator chooses a machine and that machine is assigned a role, actually it's a little bit more complicated. That role is actually uh, distributed over another committee and the uh, input values are, are shared in some uh, way among this committee. And, 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 and this is something that is, is not just one solution, is, is a necessity of these protocols. Okay, so after all these uh, things, and this, you know, we, we came from, it started from something very simple like, uh, uh, you know, this uh, idea of a BRF, of self-selection, um, small com uh, committees, random committees, you only speak once, all of the things that individually are simple, but when you really want to implement this and put it to work, are, are, are not simple anymore. Uh, but Fortunately, there were still there are things we can do. Actually, we can we 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 can show maybe the strongest possible result here is that basically any computation, any any computation, any any, any uh, distributed uh, efficient computation can have an information theoretic also uh, multi, a, a protocol doing that uh, that. Uh, computational task and information theoretic means that, you know, it's secure even against uh, um, uh, a computationally unbounded, uh, 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 computationally unbounded adversaries. Uh, so, so, okay, so, so the role as the, the, the role based protocol can be information theoretic. What cannot be information theoretic is the role assignment. So you can combine an information theoretic uh, YOSO multi-party uh, computation with any computational uh, role assignment. As I said, these two parts are, um, are, uh, are disjoint and can be combined in different ways. So you can take the information theoretic protocol 
uh, with any computational role assignment. Uh, and together, you get actually a computational EOSO MPC for basically any, any, any function. Um, now, we can do things that are more specific and somewhat more efficient for specific uh, 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 functions, in particular for social, special cryptography. Uh, you know, we show how to do proactive secret sharing in the YOSO model, and from that you can build many things like uh, threshold signatures, threshold encryption, pseudo-random functions. You can even do fully homomorphic encryption in threshold decryption and get uh, the functionality, the very strong functionality of uh, obfuscation. Uh, and you know, using all these tools, you can build the blockchain applications. You know, our ideal of having at the blockchain as a trusted party computing on private input and, you know, things that I mentioned before, Oracle state proofs, uh, signing and decrypting on behalf of smart contracts, uh, enabling tunable privacy, for example, the, 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 what I said about uh, medical records only decrypting uh, a subset of your information and only sending it to, to uh, the the uh, uh, allowed, allowed parties. Uh, and you can use this also for auditing while, you know, privacy preserving auditing. Uh, you can actually also uh, support the regulations that, you know, things that only if you do a transfer of more than $10,000, then a, a regulator can learn about that and, and things of that kind. Uh, now, uh, some of the things like the information theoretic is really, you know, feasi feasibility results very non-practical. Things like the threshold cryptography is more practical. Uh, bringing all of these to actual practice at the level of scalability that we would like will require more work. And this is good news for you because it means that, you know, we this subject is far from being closed. There is a lot of work to be done at uh, different levels because there are so many components to these protocols. So you are all uh, invited uh, to, 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 to work on this. I think it's a very promising uh, direction, uh, but uh, something that we hopefully will see more in practice in the, in the years to come. And that's it for that presentation. Um, I think you have a copy of the slides it includes this uh, slide with some uh, with with some relevant uh, uh, references uh, on which this this presentation is based. Okay, I think that that's uh, that's all on my side. Now we can go to to the questions.